Welcome everyone to the fourth of Self Help Africa's new series of self, uh, Science for Development webinars. And this panel discussion is focused on the BT Young Scientist category for, uh, for technology. There are four such categories in the BT Young Scientist. And so the whole series uh, will be uh, available online to dip into as, as a resource. Uh, but you do not need to have seen uh, the series in order or indeed necessarily watch them all. Perhaps one of the categories being uh, covered is of particular relevance to your class or your project ideas. Uh, but we do hope that each webinar will be engaging, uh, informative and inspiring for students and teachers. Further, uh, we aim to raise awareness of possible career paths that the science for development field offers. Therefore, each panel includes scientists currently working in Ireland and in our development programs in Africa. I'm your host and I'm part of Self Help Africa's development education team, working with schools, universities and the general public here in Ireland. Each year, Self Help Africa, along with Irish Aid, facilitates the Science for Development Award at the BT Young Scientists. And these webinars are aimed at raising the level of awareness of this award and its criteria of researching environmental and social issues faced by communities and regions beyond our shores. In this way, we are aligned with the principles behind the UN Sustainable Development Goals which are to focus on the most vulnerable first and to leave nobody behind. Each of these uh, webinars features a student project from the last uh, Young Scientist exhibition, one which we identified as noteworthy and of fulfilling the criter criteria of the Science for Development Award. So today we have with us Elliot Kranz of Sandy Mount Park, uh, Educate Together in Dublin, Hi there, Elia. Can you hear me? I can, yeah. How's life in Dublin now as I'm coming from rural Cork? Is it is it busy again? Uh, yeah, it's busy. It's, you know, about as miserable as it generally is. It's raining. Out, so. <laughs> so we'll hear we'll hear from Elliot's research uh, into domestic scale uh, wind turbines shortly. So we also have a past winner of our award with us, Tara McGrath, who won back in 2008 and got to visit Ethiopia as part of the prize. Tara is now head of innovation at the pharmaceutical company Novartis. Uh, you're very welcome, Tara. Thanks very much. Thanks for giving away my age. I'm <laughs> super young, pretend that I am. Ah, <laughs> uh, well, you know, it's it's all online, so you can't, can't, <laughs> can't deny it. That's it, yeah. But I was going to ask you quickly, um, so you got to go to Ethiopia with your your innovative stove. Is that a is that a vivid memory still? Absolutely. It was probably one of the most pivotal moments in my life, and it taught me some of the biggest lessons. Um, and I'll I'll share some of them later. Brilliant. We also have with us Brendan Smith, Hi. who's connected to the Science Foundation Ireland uh, and NUI Galway. Uh, as well as working with young coders across Africa via the program Africa Code Week. You're very welcome, Brendan. Yeah, many thanks. Yeah, actually, the Institute is the Insight uh, Center for Data Analytics, funded by Science Foundation Ireland. And uh, one of their uh, um, uh, centers, uh, sites is here in Galway. And then finally, uh, we always include uh, a scientist uh, from uh, further afield and, and particularly from our program, Self Help uh, Africa's programs in Africa. Uh, so today we have Julius with us, Julius Rono, uh, our program manager in Kenya. Julius, you're most welcome. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Aaron, and uh, welcome everyone. I'm joining in from Nairobi, Kenya which is uh, in East Africa. And today I'm lucky to be in the city of Nairobi. Otherwise I really work with the communities down in the Rift Valley 
uh, in in a county called Baringo. Brilliant. So we can't wait to hear your programs. And I, I I I have to, as I look at everyone on the camera there, I have to say, Julius, you have the coolest chair, which I know <laughs> for, for, for technology and and all things computer gaming, the chair is very important. And uh, yeah, you're rocking the chair. So fair play. thank you so much. And you can have you can have a, a small view of oh, Nairobi. Uh, look at uh, that. Yeah. Look at, look at all those trees. That's yes, fantastic. that is Nairobi, and um, it's doing it's quite okay. Thank you so much. Okay, so that completes our panel. So if I can go back to Elliot, so we can hear about uh, a, a recent BT Young Scientist project. You focused on wind turbines. Uh, and the title of your project was A Twist in the Turbine, a portable, economical and efficient wind turbine for the use in developing nations and consumer markets. Um, and I know you were looking at it as in a, a domestic uh, size rather than, a, you know, the big, these big scale uh, uh, turbines we hear about sometimes. But for us, the reason we, we spotted your project was because you mentioned a focus on developing nations. So can you explain uh, how you came to, to that focus for your project? The domestic scale and everything of it lends itself to a sort of decentralized grid. A lot of people in these developing nations can't really rely on those in power to help them out with their energy needs. So they need a way where they can rely on themselves. And that was kind of what this was trying to achieve. Yeah, I like that uh, power in in in, t in different ways, uh, taking yeah. back the power. Um, that's really cool, and and so that's where you fitted it into the the criteria uh, of our award last year. Um, the the BT Young Scientists had to go online, had to be virtual rather than a, a physical event. Uh, as is this event coming up in, in January next year, is all going to be online. So instead of the physical event in the RDS with all the, the stalls, um, students had to produce a short video to describe their project. So we thought to show uh, Elliot's um, short three minute video of his project as a way of explaining his research. We do have to remind ourselves that Elliot did this all during full lockdown. So he had to come up with his research and his video with what he had uh, at home. Hello, I'm Elliot Kranz. I go to Sandy Mount Park ETSS. My project is called A Twist in the Turbine. Essentially, it aims to design and test an attachment um, for wind turbines um, to make them better suited for the domestic scale so uh, with a kind of an added focus on getting them ready to be rolled out in energy impoverished countries so i have five distinct criteria for my energy solution to meet here they are um the concept i came up with to meet these criteria was a wind turbine that doesn't actually contact the wind itself instead it uses an attachment to contact the wind for it so my experimental method went as such i built this wind tunnel i uh i built this laminarizer i built my models and i test them out my controls were this and my results were this and as you can see my attachment did make a difference when it was introduced to the horizontal wind turbine but when it was introduced to the vertical wind turbine on its own did far better than my wind turbine uh, a little less than three times better so that's a little that was a little disheartening but I, f I, I all hope was not lost because i figured out that my test bed was causing issues with the rpm of my attachment installed horizontal turbine but i couldn't actually change that because of the size constraints however what i could do was introduce the, those same parameters to the vertical wind turbine. I did introduce the wall to the vertical wind turbine. The RPM dropped completely. Correct, it proves that the test bed was causing issues. However, it means that overall, all my results are basically inconclusive. The only way I could know for sure if my attachment is working or not is by testing it out with a diffuser 
to make the flow work better uh, in, in a large wind tunnel. Uh, I, I obviously can't do that. My conclusion was basically that, you know, further studies need to be completed, and they will be. But what I've got right now, you know, it, it's a little hopeful. There, This project could still be worth pursuing. I don't know for sure anything. It might be a dud. But I will keep working at it, and I hope to be back next year with a, a more conclusive project. Thank you for, for, for allowing us to share that because it's a very honest uh, video. Um, and uh, so, and it shows, I think a lot for, for students that are heading into to research and projects that it might not work out, but that doesn't mean it's not uh, valid. Uh, and you were faced into uh, all manner of extra additional challenges, weren't you? Because you were out of school, couldn't go anywhere. I, I'm sure resort, getting resources and things were challenging. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I had to, I spent kind of like half my project time just trying to build that uh, wind tunnel was really the main thing. But I think and I, the really impressive, I think the way you, you uh, demonstrated what you were tr trying to do uh, and then realize and, and and demonstrated the the where the problems were you know rather than trying to uh pretend uh it was working or make the best of it you know so what what people might not have seen was your criteria um so the criteria you chose for your project to begin with which is what again makes it relevant to us um is um you were looking at um something being uh lightweight cheap and transportable um, more efficient, not dangerous to wildlife, near silent, uh, and running uh, non-stop. Uh, so you, there was a, some really interesting uh, um, challenges you were setting yourself. So can, can you remember how you came up with that list and why those were important? Yeah, well, um, kind of it being easily transportable and it being fairly small lend each other to accept to like uh, each other, I feel like. Um, and that was mainly just to get down kind of the price, the cost for those who need it. The other criteria, like uh, it not being a danger to wildlife and it being fairly quiet, were more focused on complaints I had heard about wind turbines and why some people were apprehensive towards them. Um, although, a lot of them aren't really substantiated. Like the wildlife concern is actually fairly, uh, it, well, actually, sorry, I won't get into it, but um, it being easily transportable and it being kind of consumer available and um, it, it just, it wouldn't work if it was only being able to be bought by large companies or something or sold to the government and so on. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's great. I mean, that's that's what we're interested here in particular is is technology that is accessible uh, yeah. to everybody, um, and uh, it, therefore it has to be affordable. Especially, and when we're talking about um, at regions like we, we go to Julius now next uh, in in regional parts of say Kenya, for example, uh, it has to be yeah very robust and easily fixed uh, locally. So mm -hmm. then you have to use materials and things that are affordable and available. So you've had about a year now to reflect on what you did. And uh, have you had thoughts or, or uh, since that video was made? Yeah, I, I've been thinking more about the project recently. Uh, really, it's gotten me thinking on like energy storage and kind of that kind of a thing more so. Right, but so interesting. Uh, I, I, I definitely want to return to it at some point. I haven't really gotten a chance to, but uh, I still have the wind tunnel lying up in my attic somewhere. So uh, I, I definitely I definitely see myself returning to it at some point in the future. Great, great. Well, I hope so. Or something else, you know, it leads yeah. you to, to the next idea, the next sure, generation. Yeah. Great, so th thanks, Elliot. 
Uh, now, if I can go over to Julius, uh, Self Help Africa's program manager in Kenya. Uh, so please, Julius, um, tell us a little bit about uh, your programs there that you're involved with and any technological innovations that you are seeing pre presently in Kenya. Thank you, Aaron. Um, I'll do a little bit of uh, presentation. I, finally, I'll talk about a few innovations that we are working in in this program. One of our quite ambitious programs in Kenya at Self Help Africa, and this is uh, the Baringo Resilience Initiative, Nurturing Greater Opportunity. It's one of the large programs that we are working on. So for this program, we are in a consortium of partners, um, which include government, uh, Self-Help Africa is the lead, but then we also work with uh, two local organizations, one uh, called Farming Systems Kenya, and the other one, Agric uh, Sustainable Agriculture Information Initiative. So this program uh, is implemented in uh, Baringo, which is um, in the Rift Valley of Kenya. I think uh, most of you from last year, you heard about the rising waters um, in the on the valley, on the Rift Valley base in Kenya. And some of those lakes are actually in uh, Baringo where we implement this program. Uh, so it's a quite a challenging environment. It is an arid and semi-arid area that we are working in. And largely this program is focusing on uh, building resilience of uh, vulnerable communities uh, in order to cope with the shocks um, related to climate change. And recently we saw the rising waters and also the locusts also <laughs> visited this area. So it's a quite a challenging area. And uh, what we are doing is actually to build resilience of communities to be able to uh, cope with these uh, uh, shocks. We want to work within the next 48 months to be able to reach um, 60,000 beneficiaries. The kind of interventions that we look at is one is to increase production and productivity in terms of livestock and crop production. Also to improve the rangelands uh, through uh, improved land management uh, practices and also um, nutrition and hygiene practices to be improved. And most important in this area, we are looking at a community that has one of the highest uh, stunting rates in the world. But in general, we also want to ensure that communities um, build uh, or create wealth so that they are able to have more income. And uh, finally, I want to say these objectives, we are doing it through um, what we call um, uh, climate resilient and nutrition sensitive agriculture. We look at it having five output areas. So we want to increase production and productivity through a raft of interventions. One is uh, strengthening the farmer groups. Actually, if you look at all that is um, uh, areas that actually uh, hamper the progress of the vulnerable communities. So increasing uh, access to pasture and fodder conservation and livestock upgrading from indigenous to more adaptive breeds is what we are doing. And uh, to cap uh, or to adopt to weather challenges, we are also building an application that is going to uh, assist uh, pastoralists as much to find water and uh, pasture. So in terms of increasing, uh, improving uh, knowledge on nutrition and hygiene, we are working with communities to, 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 do, uh, to ensure a dietary diversity in terms of the kind of food they have. And there we are working 
through innovations in uh, kitchen gardening and fruit tree um, establishment. For schools, we are targeting children who are um, uh, below the, around the age of six to, to 12 to teach them about nutrition um, in, and health education. But for land, the third output is about land management. So here we are looking at how do we improve uh, nature? How do we improve the land that we produce uh, food and the livestock on? Because of serious degradation issues in this area, we, have, um, we are working on six aspects. One is to uh, rehabilitate water catchment areas through planting trees and also um, building, building water, water troughs to be able to assist the pastoralists access water. And also working with communities to install micro irrigation and um, water harvesting techniques in their households. There is an invasive species, I, know, I don't know if most of you know, uh, called Prosopis uh, juliflora, which is covering much of the rangelands in Baringo. And what we are doing here is um, introducing a technology to crush the pods of this uh, shrub or tree so that it can make animal feeds. Finally, um, we are working towards market access. We look at it as in terms of to ensure that um, the model that we are running is sustainable. We have to have a market uh, linkage so we work through, uh, we work through uh, technology, technologies in value addition, especially for honey. We also work um, by rehabilitating uh, livestock markets and building capacities of um, traders on agri-enterprise agri development. But oh, for all the communities, we are introducing um, um, a financial aspect where we build the, the capacity of communities in terms of uh, creating savings in what we call um, uh, savings and loan associations. I just want to highlight some three, four uh, technologies that we are promoting. I want to talk about, um, in terms of this uh, pest and disease control, we are working with um, um, an organization that are partnered with us uh, on an application called the PlantWise, uh, PlantWise application, which is an app that uh, assists farmers and um, uh, extension workers to deliver extension messages as regards uh, uh, plant diseases and also pests. So the PlantWise app is quite uh, effective. We've used it at Self Help Africa in other programs. And in this program, we are also promoting uh, that through what we are calling uh, plant clinics. We establish plant clinics nearer to the farmers so that they are able to get this information uh, firsthand. Uh, number two, in terms of the health, uh, health and uh, dietary diversity. We are also having an application called Nuru, which is built and uh, used in this part of, in this region um, quite extensively. And this is uh, an application that assists mothers and uh, health extension workers to monitor uh, the growth of children and detect uh, at an early stage um, the, the risks of uh, stunting. In terms of um, weather, we, I said climate change and drought is a serious issue in this region. So currently what we are doing, we are partnering with one organization to build an application, uh, a weather application that is integrates uh, one, the issue, uh, pasture and forage availability, water availability, and also marketing information. It's still work in progress. When complete, our pastoralists can be able to scout for, food, for feed and for water. As you know, most of our, our, our livestock keepers are pastoralists or nomads. They move from one place to one place to another. So this application we are building, I, I think we are 
um, on course to start it now, but uh, there is a lot of um, optimism that this is really going to assist um, the program and assist the pastoralists get better livelihoods. Finally, um, I talked about the invasive species, which we I call Prosopis juliflora. And what we are doing is to enhance uh, feed, is uh, to crush the pods so that uh, animal feed can be found, but also the land that is, is, is left from the trees that we crush can now be opened up for pasture for the livestock to, to graze and also release some land for crop um, production. Apart from that, uh, for the grains, we are also promoting technologies for threshing and value addition so that we can be able to cap the challenges of post-harvest losses in the grains, um, especially millet, sorghum, and uh, pulses like green grams. Thank you so much. Uh, th thank you, Julius. Uh, that, that gave us a real insight to the, the many, many challenges that the communities and region that you're working with face. Uh, and then the idea of these uh, applications. We are aware of um, smartphones and, and tablets, but can even be on simple uh, handheld uh, you know, phones that are not smartphones, not internet phones, but just simple uh, text orientated apps and use of cameras. So to identify uh, maybe pests in, in, in crops early uh, by the farmers themselves and sending that to, to the likes of yourselves in Nairobi and getting early warning systems that way and sharing information through these different um, field schools that you mentioned or labs in, in, the, in the regions rather than just in the cities. Um, so thanks uh, a lot, uh, Julius, for all that. Yeah. Lots to, to think on and, and on places to, that possibly people might want to look into more about um, areas of research, particularly with this idea of, of the, what is possible with a, a smartphone uh, and how that can be shared uh, so quickly now uh, to experts and back. If we can move on then. Uh, to our past winner of our Science for Development Award, Tara McGrath, in, in Waterford. Um, and since winning the award, which was a, a few years ago, um, a lot has happened for you and, and you have been involved in many uh, innovations in Ireland and, and internationally. So can you tell us a bit of, of what you are up to and have been up to? Yeah, so I am going to tell you a little bit about um, my journey. And to do that, I'm going to use a journey map. I'm Tara, and right now, my job is that I'm the head of product innovation at a pharmaceutical company uh, called Umbertus. So I work on digital capability in that area. A very long time ago, I did the Young Scientist in second year, um, pretty much because my teacher was really cool. And he started talking about taking us ice skating and that we might get to go to the RDS. So I thought to myself, this teacher's really cool. Maybe we can go ice skating. I might even meet some people that have similar interests to me. The next thing that happened was that I really loved the young scientist. Um, and I started to do it every single year. So in third year, I came up with a cancer treatment. In fourth year, I came up with an innovation game. And then um, in second year, I came up with a way to test dissolved oxygen before and after a water wheel. I had so many ideas and I had this real love and excitement for the young scientist. I thought to myself, the young scientist is the best thing ever. I get to meet people um, that I like, that are kind of like me. I get to share my ideas. I get to hear about cool stuff. And I really hoped that nobody knew that I didn't take science as a subject, which was one of the things that was in, in the back of my head all of the time. The next step of my journey was in sixth year, I thought I kind of hit the jackpot. I designed a fuel efficient stove to help women in sub-Saharan Africa because indoor air pollution was really detrimental and I wanted to help those women. I was over the moon. I was ready to celebrate. Luckily, uh, Self Help Africa got to see my project and they brought me to Ethiopia to test out my stove. One woman whispered in my ear in the middle of testing this amazing invention uh, that this is really nice, but how can this cook the food that we eat? Because we eat in Jira and that's a pancake. 
and you made the stove that's a big pot. So that's nice, but it's not going to work for us. So I was shocked. I felt like I failed. And my thought was, oops, I thought this was the best idea ever. And so did everybody else. How did I mess this up? Being in Ethiopia and being able to speak to the women and hearing what they were looking for gave me such a great insight into what to do next. So I felt like I was getting schooled. And I thought to myself, imagine what I could have achieved or we could have achieved together if I had the opportunity to ask these women what they needed. That was in sixth year, so it was lots of pressure, lots of, um, you know, what are you going to do now? So I had to make a decision between industrial design and NCAD or international development. And I decided to choose international development because I needed to learn so much more about that area. So over the years, I worked with lots of different organizations, including a brilliant internship with Self Help Africa that I got to work on giving uh, smallholder farmers a voice. Um, I was so lucky, I had lots of opportunities. I have so many opportunities to work on different problems and speak to different people all the time. But I kept switching roles. And whenever uh, things became operational, I started to get very bored. I love my job, but there's something that's really, really missing for me. How can I use this diverse career to my advantage? So I started to look at tech um, and starting off with a foundation uh, in the Raspberry Pi Foundation at Coder Dojo. And then eventually, well, right now I'm finding myself in a pharmaceutical company. And I thought this might be where I fit because there are so many cool things going on. And it turns out the tech companies are now figuring out that lesson that I learned all the way back in Ethiopia, that we need to put our users at the center. So one of the things I heard Elliot say that made me really excited was that you heard complaints from people. And that's how you started to think about what you would do. If you heard what Julius was talking about, he had so many different user groups. He knew who the people were that he was trying to solve the problem for. So now, my job is to support teams to put the patient first and put it at the center of their ideas. So rather than coming up with lots of ideas, I work with super smart scientists, doctors, um, healthcare providers, different foundations, um, different teams to put their ideas into action. And I have a whole load of tools that help me to do that here. I've got some lessons. So the very first thing is you don't have to be a scientist to come up with a cool idea. Technology is about lots of different things. So you don't have to be an artist to be a designer. You don't have to be a scientist, but there's lots of different methods um, and careers that you can do in the field of science and technology. And there's so many different things that you can use. So my suggestions are, I've got the journey map is the way, what I used to show you guys my journey. And that's a really great tool. Step inside the shoes of a user. We've got an empathy map over here. And if you're looking for any of these things, there's this website called the Toolbox Toolbox. And it's got everything that you could possibly imagine to help you um, put your user at the center. Thanks, Tara. <laughs> That's a new one on me, the Toolbox. Um, is, can I ask you quickly, um, is there a, a particular or a few innovations that you're looking at or you've heard about? Because I'm working in the medical area, um, a lot of the work is around preventative health measures. Pharmaceutical companies haven't historically been um, supportive of, uh, but really thinking about preventative health. How can we stop ourselves getting sick? Um, and there's lots of really interesting things being done in the healthcare space in Ireland. Um, I just finished a postgrad in healthcare innovation, which was uh, really, really fantastic. So met some really cool people that are launching some really interesting stuff in the near future. Thanks Tara for that um, and all those tools and, and the insights of uh, the use of emojis uh, to get your message across uh, and what you've just said there I think will link really well into uh, what Brendan works in and his passions. So if I can introduce Brendan Smith in Galway uh, I think you're all about pre pre preventative medicine, aren't you, Brendan, and, yeah. and, and healthy living uh, yeah. and, and that kind of merging, which I think is interesting. We were, uh, we're all talking about the pros of technology, 
Yes. But also healthy living and 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 what, where the two come together. Yeah, absolutely. And, and not relying on technology yeah. solely. So, uh, yeah. Brendan, tell us about uh, Insight and, and what's yes. going on in Galway. Okay, so Insight is um, the Europe's largest uh, center for data analytics, and it's about deriving value from big data, turning it into um, uh, solutions uh, for society using technology. But I have to put it in, into context is. Uh, what Tara was saying, it's great to see she's coming from the medical background, but the medical profession have got it so wrong for so long. For so um, many decades now, we've been told to take the pill. The pill is going to solve everything, you know, rather than looking at our natural body and, uh, and the actual herbs that are in nature. And there's a great group of, of doctors at the moment, the Irish Doctors for the Environment, and they're promoting the green prescription. So our disconnect from nature, and don't forget it's the rest of nature, have led to the problems that we have today. Science and technology has given us climate change, has given us biodiversity loss, has given us the uh, degradation of soils. And when we talk about Africa, for our young people here today, we also have to look at Ireland. Ireland was the great rainforest um, country of Europe for so long. We were covered from one end of the country to the other. And what's happening today in Brazil and across Africa and Indonesia with the last of the rainforests of the world is what happened in Ireland in the 17th century. Commercial farming came in, colonization came in, the indigenous people were destroyed, the trees were cut down uh, to build uh, for export or to take for export or for natural resources. The indigenous people were, were basically annihilated and so was the wildlife. So when we talk about extinction in Africa today, let's look at extinction in Ireland. Let's look at the loss of the wolf, the bear, the, the boar. We're all living in this global village and we have to be, on, uh, be truthful. I love science and technology with a passion. I think science and technology is going to change the world for the, be the better. But we, it's the abuse of science and technology um, that has led to this. And that's why I promote citizen science. I used to be called an outreach officer from the university. Uh, it was a one-way process. I told people what they uh, should be doing and how technology is going to work. That's totally gone a U-turn now. We talk about citizen science. We put people right at the heart of the process. So when we're coming up with solutions to the problems of society, let's talk to the people that are suffering. They know best what the actual attitude is. So this is a total different mindset. The way to the future for, for me is to learn from nature. If we want to save the world, we talk about circular economy and, and biodiversity restoration and organic and uh, re uh, renewable energies and all of these great things. This is what nature has been doing since it came onto the planet. So for the young people here, I say, you want to save the world, you behave like a tree. What does a tree do? It uses renewable energies uh, from the sun. We talk about reducing the food miles. That's what a tree does. It takes local nutrients. It takes what's around it and turns it into, um, into food, in, into the sugars. It filters out what's in the air, uh, bad in terms of light, called CO2, and it gives it what is good for the rest of us, oxygen. So think like a tree, so to speak. Learn from a tree. I spend a lot of time in Africa teaching coding. I was originally involved in Coder Dojo many years ago. And every day in Africa, I learn something new. So you go to um, a fairly hot area and you see this um, beautiful small mountain called an anthill and that's what scientists and uh, architects and designings are, designers are learning now how to design the skyscrapers of the future. How come all of these huge population of ants, hundreds of thousands, can live in this small space in a really hot climate and not suffocate to death? And that's what we're learning now is how to design a skyscraper learning from ants. So for too long, nature has been out there. For too long, ordinary people have been out there. And citizen science is all about bringing people together and making a difference. And remember, the modern world, as we know it today, was founded on plastic. <laughs> and look what happened with plastic. And you know why plastic was invented? It was invented to save the elephant, the African elephant, from extinction. Because we were exploiting them in the developed world for the ivory, for combs, or for buttons, and for billets. And 
the biggest billiard company in the world at the time was in, in, in America. Uh, they came up in late uh, 19th century with a $10,000 um, uh, prize for the persons that could come up with an alternative to ivory, a substitute, and that's how plastic came about. What I'm involved in at the moment is we're trying to make our city sustainable. We now live on the uh, an urban planet. In, in Europe, 75% of its population live in, in cities, and we have to bring the jungle back into our lives. We have to make our cities not just concrete and and um, and tarmac but also green and blue i was going to show a lot of slides but i just have to say really we have to behave like a tree really we have to learn from nature really we have to work with people rather than tell people what to do and really as irish people we have to learn that the problems of today in the great rainforests of the tropics is what Ireland went through. We have to learn. Ireland is great. There's a lot of great things going from it, but it's sterile. It's it's and the green revolution that we were told was going to be the great savior of the world in places like India. You know what it led to? Pesticides and herbicides. So you poison the soil, soil to give greater fertility, and then it becomes depleted, and then you cut down more rainforests and so on. Same happened in Ireland, and we have to learn from that. So us as scientists and technologists learn from the past. Work with people, work with nature. And yeah. I think I'll stop there. Yeah, Thank no, you. Brendan, that's brilliant. Awesome, awesome. Really uh, powerful. Uh, a little bit hard on the, on the technology people and the scientists. Yeah. So how do we marry the two? Because I know you have a, a TED yes. talk, yes. Uh, which I recommend people could look at. Uh, yeah. Brendan Smith's TED talk on smart cities and using Galway yeah. as an example. But you have a lovely phrase at the end of that and it's something like people today need a smart device yes. in one hand and yes. a spade in the other yeah absolutely yes so how do you uh, just expand on that a little bit what i have in my hands oh you can't see it too well there the phone that's the world of knowledge right in our hand that's the device like i love science and technology i have to put that into context that's what i do i promote science and technology the future of education is we know about reading and writing and maths. The, the fourth pillar of education is actually coding. We have to teach our young people, not just to be digital users, but to dig, uh, digital creators. And technology is wonderful of telling us what the problems are and having, having us come up with solutions. If you look at satellite um, photo uh, photography, that was a wake up call to us. We suddenly realized ever since satellite photography went in in the late sixties, how the actual glaciers are actually getting smaller and smaller in the north and south so it's it's a tool that we should use as an information tool but also as a, as a mechanism for change so to, for instance at the moment we're developing sensor technologies in the old days that used to be almost on the side of a truck now we're putting all those sensors into our actual phone so the way we're working at say air quality at the moment what we're doing is we're putting in filters into it so when i go into a room i can straight away know what the oxygen level is, what the CO2 level is, what the particulars level is. And all of that is in one's hands. And listening to the, to the talk um, from Julius about what's happening in Africa, the ability to actually know different things about crops and plants and, and so forth is in this. So I firmly believe as was said, it's like having um, a, a smart device in one hand and a spade in the other. We have to marry the two. The bottom line should be that we should, the technology we should develop for the good of people and the good of, of, of the world, not to abuse the world. This one device in our hand is fantastic uh, and learn to use it well. Don't become a slave to the machine. And the other thing I have to say about a phone, there is a hundred times more um, gold, the one ton of phones than there is discarded phones than there is one ton of uh, gold ore. This one device in my hand is also a mine. And to uh, our waste, and we're the only species that produces waste. We hold this on the, this phone for two years and then we throw it away. Look at all the resources that we're not exploiting from this phone. Why are we digging more mines when we have a mine in our hands? Everything is recyclable or should be recyclable, just like a tree. There is no such thing as waste uh, with a tree. It, whatever is left over is put in as it becomes a nutrient. 
what we have to do is like the rest of nature, get rid of, 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 of um, waste. And we start with the phone. When I was Apple's first salesman for, for Ireland back in 1982, in those days, the phones used to be open. We could repair things and upgrade them. And we have to bring back the right to repair, you know? So yeah, to, that kind of summarizes, I hope, what I'm trying yeah. to say. No, it's brilliant, Brendan, it's brilliant. So I, I, I mean, we're limited on time. So I'll, I'll just yes. recommend, uh, and that's what part of this, these webinars are about is, is giving students and teachers insights of, of what's going on and where to look for ideas and support. So you've got yeah. the Insight uh, group in Galway, you've got the uh, Science Foundation Island website, which is linked to Citizen Science Island. Yeah. There's also EU level Citizen Science websites and programs which shows all different ways of getting involved in science uh, and, and then ideas about programs. You've learned from, from Tara about uh, the, the innovations within medicine and, and pharmaceutical companies and of which uh, there are a lot in Ireland. Students shouldn't be shy contacting um, uh, experts and foundations and organizations like universities because they are there and, and surprisingly open uh, once you land on the right person to, to your questions and to give you advice. And even Julius in his presentation uh, was brave enough to share his email. I'm sure he will try his best to, to offer you support if, if your project has relevance. Tara, can I ask you quickly just to express what you put in the chat there about the importance of uh, critical engagement yeah, so just it was what Brenda was saying about the four pillars of education. I think we're presented with a lot of information and we're presented with a lot of data, but being able to question where that's like, who is saying it, what's the agenda behind it? What is the feeling of the person? Um, so trying to empathize with their situation because engaging with all of the information that we have in a critical way is really, really important. Um, and that's a skill that, I think is will be one of the most important moving forward when there's so much information being given to us all the time. Who said it? Why they're saying it? What's the situation that they're coming from? Also, people can change their mind. Ask why. I think that's a vital uh, thing to reflect on is, uh, is critical thinking. And you shared the idea of empathy for the person that you're thinking about or, or the end user, if it's not you. The innovation has to be uh, usable at their end and, a, and a, a request from that side, not just a cool innovation that excites from our, from our side. Elliot, it uh, seems you were at the BT Young Scientist last or this year and we're heading into the next one. What, what tips do you have, particularly with it being a, a virtual event? The way the judging works is they bring you into a Zoom call with the judges. I'd say it's definitely good to maybe bring sort of a physical representation of your model or of your project with you, even if you're doing a PowerPoint. Also, just with time management, uh, definitely start on your experimental method straight away even if you're not entirely sure the like the intricacies of what you're testing, know how you're going to test it and start working on how you can test it. Because I kind of did my wind tunnel towards the end and that really bit me in the butt later on. Oh, okay, great, great. Uh, thanks for that. And then maybe just to finish up, Julius, uh, if I go back to you, do you have any final uh, words or responses to what you heard uh, from the others? My final remarks is that uh, there's a lot that happens um, elsewhere. I think for us in, uh, in, in, in East Africa and the region, uh, there, is, there are still a lot of challenges um, that uh, affect our people, uh, especially in the light of climate change uh, the issue of food security. So I think um, technology and uh, what the students at the university are doing is quite uh, very well placed to solve the problems of the world. So as, as, as we get support every other time from Europe in terms of uh, even the money to run these programs. We would also have an opportunity to have the technologies that are developed 
to be able to um, accompany the funding so that we are able to solve the myriad of problems uh, here. And I think there is a lot of opportunity also for um, overseas students to see the challenges that are still there in this part of the world so that they can be able to, to, to develop tailor-made technologies. Of course, we know the comparative advantages of, of uh, this, the North and the South. And if we work together in synergy through linkages like this, I think it's the right thing to do. And um, I would encourage that uh, should the students in, 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 in Europe get an opportunity to do research in Africa, I think it's something uh, worth uh, taking up. Thank you so much. Well, no, thank you. That's a, a great way to, to round up the discussion. So that just leaves me to say thank you to you all for giving your time uh, for this uh, webinar on, on technology. Uh, thanks for all your inputs. Uh, and one last call out there, uh, uh, sort of spurned on by Tara, is that we need more girls uh, entering technology into the field of technology because it is actually very evident that we have done these webinars on the different categories um, and girls are very well represented in general, but not uh, represented in technology. So thanks again, everybody. And uh, uh, thanks for everyone that attended. Good luck for any students and teachers heading into the BT Young Scientists and do spread the, the word about the Science for Development Award uh, run by South Africa and Irish Aid. Uh, and encourage your students to, to consider sustainable development goals in the way that they present their project. Because even if a project didn't start with that global uh, angle, it's not impossible to look at it with a bigger picture uh, and show the benefits beyond Ireland if that was the original focus.